500 years ago, on the western coast of South America, thrived the largest pre-colonial empire to ever inhabit the Americas, the Inca Empire. Based in the city of Cusco, the Inca spread all throughout a vast expanse encompassing modern-day Peru, Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, and Ecuador, and did so without any of the fun stuff the Old World had, like iron, large draft animals, wheels, or written language. With this in mind, how did the Inca rule their empire, and how powerful was said empire? The Inca believes themselves the descendants of four brothers and four sisters, who emerged from the cave at Temple Tuco, known as Capac Tuco, circa the early 13th century. Oh, by the way, please don't expect me to be able to pronounce every Quechua word and name here perfectly right. After some arguments and disagreements among the brothers, Ayarmanco and his sisters would lead the Inca people to Cusco, Ayarmanco planting his golden staff in the fertile land and the Inca chasing off the locals who already inhabited the area. Ayarmanco, now called Manco Capac, became the first emperor of the Inca, him and his sisters said to have built the first Inca homes in the valleys themselves. Manco Capac died around 1230, leaving his son, Sinchiroca, to rule the kingdom of Cusco then merely a city-state in and around Cusco itself. The empire we would know today as the Yanka Empire got its start in 1438, when Cusiyupanqui launched the conquest of many neighboring kingdoms, namely the Chancas, who had previously attacked Cusco, causing the previous Sapa Inca to flee along with who would have been his successor. This military victory under his belt, Cusiyupanqui became the ninth Sapa Inca and adopted the name Pachacuti, Pachacuti comes from the Quechua term Pachacutic, meaning one who overturns space and time, or more traditionally, one who shakes the earth. And like any conqueror who actually planned to keep his land, he reforms the Inca political system, establishing the Tehuantinsuyu. The Tehuantinsuyu was a centralized provincial government, with the Inca ruling over the four provinces of Chinchaisuyu, Antisuyu, Cuyasuyu, and Kuntisuyu all radiating in the four cardinal directions from Cusco, and hence the etymology of the term, with Tawa meaning four, and Tin forming a group, thus Tawantin meaning quartet, and Suyu referring to a province or region, literally a quartet of provinces. In addition, Tawantin Suyu was what the Inca actually called their empire at the time, as the term Inca actually meant ruler, and thus more often referred to the ruling classes. Pachacuti would also commission Machu Picchu, or Machu Picchu, both pronunciations are correct, in around 1450, in a state that would be abandoned after the Spanish conquest and almost completely unnoticed by outside eyes until its resurgence in 1911, now one of the modern seven wonders of the world. Throughout its rapid expansion, the Inca would send spies to a territory they wanted to conquer, who would report back to Cusco with details on their governments and rulers. After this, the Inca would send emissaries with gifts to the rulers of these lands, promising vast material wealth if they were to join the empire. Many ended up joining voluntarily as intended, but of course if they refused, there was always the conquest option. At its height, the Inca Empire, as we will still call it for simplicity, stretched from southwestern Colombia all the way down to central Chile, and as far inland as central Bolivia. This vast empire had a population said to be anywhere from 4 to 37 million, though it was more likely somewhere around 6 to 14 million. The Inca actually kept excellent census records, and although they didn't have a true written language to do so with, they were able to account these numbers using a complex system of knotted strings known as quipus. Unfortunately, most of these strings, and the knowledge of how to decipher them, were lost to time and conquest, hence our modern uncertainties about this. Through its conquests of various other tribes and kingdoms, the Inca Empire became incredibly diverse in people, ideologies, and especially in climate. This was mainly because the empire spread north-south instead of east-west, which of course caused their climates to be much more diverse. The distance from the northern to the southern ends of the empire was roughly the same as Winnipeg to Mexico City, or Trondheim to Tripoli, or Beijing to Brunei. The empire was also mainly situated at an altitude of more than 3,000 meters, 
meaning even more different climates within the empire. This meant that they couldn't spread their knowledge of how to farm particular crops as far within their empire as, say, the Romans or Persians could. An issue which they got around by simply not. They just used different crops in different climactic areas. Which also meant that an ecological disaster in one area would not affect the rest of the empire quite as much. Also unlike their horizontally oriented Eurasian counterparts, the Inca didn't have large draft animals to do the heavy lifting. They had llamas, which did do some work, but llamas can't pull or carry as much as a cow or an ox, especially up huge mountains, meaning that manual labor was much more in fashion than in the old world. The Inca also connected all corners of the four Suyus with vast stone highways, one route along the mountains and one along the coast. While llamas were generally used for carrying bulkier goods, they could not carry an adult human, and so lighter goods, and especially messages, were transported by a system of relay runners known as chuskies. The Inca economy was also very centrally planned, and didn't really use a centralized currency so much as bartering for goods, as well as the mita, a mandatory public service for which the state would provide food and shelter in exchange for things like the roads. Like all great empires, though, the Inca would inevitably collapse to an outside power. But this time, things were a little different. In 1527, or sometime around then, Wikipedia doesn't even agree with itself there, Sampa Inca Huayna Capac suddenly died from a mysterious infectious disease. This prompted a five-year civil war between half-brothers Huascar and Atahualpa. Though Huascar spent these five years on the throne, it was Atahualpa who would emerge victorious by May 1432. That November, however, Atahualpa would be captured by Francisco Pizarro and his forces, after a meeting in which Atahualpa was allegedly presented with the Bible as the Word of God, angrily throwing it on the ground after not hearing any word. Or so it goes, there's a lot of dispute with the story. Whatever actually happened in that meeting, what happened afterward was the end of the Inca Empire and the start of the Spanish Viceroyalty of Peru. The empire fell in 1533, though various Inca elements held their ground all the way up until 1572. Despite their somewhat short existence, the Inca contributed to our modern world in numerous ways, from many of the cities that make a modern-day South America, to English words like jerky, puma, and condor, and the various crops they farmed, including corn, tomatoes, quinoa, and of course, the Baltic and Irish favorite, the potato. Even then, there were so many things I could have mentioned, but just didn't have enough time to. So actually, quite a consequential civilization. As always, thanks for watching, and especially thanks to Azriok and the Canubis Discord server for the idea. If you want to join the server, the link is down below in the description, as well as any other links you might want if you want to support the channel, follow me on Instagram or Twitter, or any of that. And of course, the subscribe button is also nearby to make sure you can learn something new every Sunday.